in infrastructure and what can art do? It, can it add to the mix? At this point, um, engineers and landscape architects and architects and uh, city planners have sort of had the purview over uh, green infrastructure. And the idea of an artist being part of it hasn't really been an idea, except in a few small areas. But I'm here to tell you that the addition of art can be really important for a number of reasons. Um, art is very good at building awareness of change, a sense that things aren't going to stay the same. And when you're dealing with nature, nothing is going to stay the same. It's in ever in flux, and it's always moving. And um, art can tell that to people, like this will be different next week after it rains, or when we have a long drought. So that's an important thing that it does. Let me put this this way. Um, art also is very good at connecting people to their surroundings, unlike a lot of green infrastructure, which kind of looks the same as the place did, only has less parking spaces after it's completed. Art has a way of bringing you into the situation and giving you a sense something has happened, something is happening here, and it gives you a connection that you need that not um, all design arts and engineering arts can bring into a site. Um, it also adds a little something. You may say, oh yeah, that's a green infrastructure thing, but you can find out more information through the art. So it, tells you something. It, it tells a little bit of the story of the site. And it can go rather deeply into chapters on the site, too, if you have time and space. Um, and it creates um, interactions. Even if art isn't actually solving the problem, and the problem has been basically solved by building architects, landscape architects, road engineers, and engineers, it can talk about um, what's going on in a way that the engineer interactions with. So um, even if the art isn't actively solving something, it's still effective in that drawing people in and giving them a relationship. Um, and it gives a sense of the wet and dry. It really celebrates the two conditions that we live in. We, you know, it, I mean, we live in a lot of sort of in between too, but you do, we have a, a lot of wet and a lot of dry and each should get equal play because they're both important to our environment. So um, bringing the wet in and celebrating the wet is something that art's really good at. Um, but also something that I'll explore a little bit today is how art can actually participate in being part of the solution, the solution to a lot of site problems that we have. Um, oftentimes these are approached by teams of engineers and building architects and landscape architects and city planners. And uh, art is sort of, in, especially in the public realm, is often considered a kind of what I call parsley around the pig, a garnish after everything went in. Not a good place for art. Art is a much more functioning thing if it can be in very early in the process and is helping solve the actual site issue. Um, whether the site issue is runoff or erosion or habitat issues or sedimentation or eutrophication, uh, there are a lot of things that art can actually do actively. And I I'm a proponent of making working artworks, putting the work back in artwork. Um, and it does really, it can address the issue and tell the story simultaneously. Just, that's a pretty great thing. So when you've actually put a lot of money into something, you can point to the art part and everyone goes, oh, I see how that, oh, I see something's going on there and now I walked in it, now I can tell what it's all about. So there's a lot about bringing the person into the newly constructed area with the art. So the construction doesn't leave people cold. We get a yard of rain a year here in this sort of northeast corridor. Um, I live in Pennsylvania myself, get this pretty much the same amount. And we're very lucky. It comes um, evenly throughout the year. It's fairly well distributed. And it, this amount of rain, I have to tip this this way, gives us this amazing landscape that we live in. Big, beautiful trees, glowing green lawns, uh, those kind of springs that you know, everyone covets except England, who has them too, with lots and lots of rain. And it's really, that's the, that's the payback for having wet weather and snow. Versus this sort of desert kitty litter landscape, which I just have nothing to say to and don't care to live in, um, 
yes, you get lots and lots and lots of dry. Though you get some serious wet all coming at the same time. And they also have to have green infrastructure, but it's on a different level. It isn't that back and forth wet and dry that we have. And we, we, love, we love to be in nature. We love to explore it, particularly when we're children. Even though this is a terribly degraded stream, this is a stream that this kid has. This is nature for this kid, and he, he's celebrating it. But we do not know how to live with rain. We are perplexed by its, its ways of, of acting, and um, we're, we're often sort of feel stranded by it. We don't understand that water has rhythms, and the waterways are, have their own rhythm of, of basically of inhaling when it's dry and exhaling when it's wet. The, the creeks and our rivers, streams, sometimes our lakes and now our oceans even more, are breathing in and out with rain or in the oceans with storms. But this breathing in and out is something that we have to get used to. People used to live with this effect. They were quite aware that you did not build in a floodplain because that somebody built there 10 years ago when their house was washed away in the, in the spring freshets. But we've forgotten a lot of that with our control of nature. And we've forgotten this amazing rhythm that these, these wet areas need a lot of space to be happy. Um, a lot of what we've built in the cities are really to keep our feet dry. Dry feet have probably driven more urban architecture than anything I can think of because we don't we don't want it to um, we don't want to be up into our ankles in our cities. So all these hard surfaces are all about draining quickly and and getting the water out from underneath us. Because we don't like this state. We don't like the mushiness of rain and post rain and a week even a week after wet weather. We don't like soggy and the in-between. And a lot of what green infrastructure needs to embrace is the in-between. Because rain needs a lot of time to soak in, and it needs a place to soak in. It really needs uh, much more than we've been giving it in the last um, number of years. Because this is our typical way. Engineering solution um, in most cities is to basically pass the buck get the water off the bridge, under the bridge, into a pipe, and then out to some distant creek and blow that creek out. Or down the rain, the storm sewer into the um, combined sewer if you're from the wrong old kind of city, and then out into some body of water that is then gets this, this giant scouring burst of water and it ruins the banks of this creek. Or this is what happens, There's a, we have to, um, create and engineer huge intakes and outtakes for all this water that we're passing down the line. What we really need to start doing is sharing our surfaces with rain. In school, everyone learns to share. You would never bring in 20 cupcakes and eat them yourself. You would always disperse them throughout the class so that everyone got one cupcake and you didn't get 20 yourself. We get out of school and we forget that entirely and we take those 20 cupcakes and that's our parking lot and that's our roof and that's our paved street and nature gets half a cupcake or one cupcake if it's lucky. So we have to get back into a sort of sense that we have to share more equitably with nature, with the spaces that when we're given a space to build, we have to give more of it to nature so that the rain has time and place to soak in. And we really need to give a home to the rain because we haven't been in um, the last, say, 100, 200 years, and, um, and it's becoming more and more of a problem as our weather gets more erratic and the rain comes more forcefully and uh, not at this nice even distribution which we've been so used to. Um, places that are dealing with rain actively, this is a, a campus at UBC in Vancouver, um, are artfully dealing with the idea that sometimes it's gonna be wet and sometimes it's gonna be dry, but it's always gonna be evocative and beautiful. Um, so what does uh, artful green infrastructure do? Um, one of the things that happens is downspout disconnection. Here is a school in um, Philadelphia. A lot of my work will be taking place in Pennsylvania um, that uh, disconnects the downspouts. 
Um, art also often makes rain gardens, too. So that's something we do that's part of green infrastructure. Uh, a lot of bioswales are created in um, some different green infrastructure projects. Uh, permeable paving and downspout disconnection together sometimes happen. Um, creating urban parks uh, and green spaces is something that artists often work on trying to do. Um, and making uh, all of the green infrastructure visible to people who are walking along the streets, who suffered through the construction of the green infrastructure and wondered what's happening and what are we getting from this. Having an um, artful interpretation often makes people understand and feel relatively more content about what's going on underground and not sort of like, we have no idea, but we couldn't park there for three months. So this interaction that we can create, this interaction with rain, we have this wonderful natural resource that falls out of the sky. It's in fairly good shape, except for highly, uh, you know, has a high pH, but, or a low pH, but it's very, um, it's a wonderful resource. And if we stopped looking at it like something we're trying to get rid of and started looking at it as something we want to enjoy and employ, we can have better design. So here's um, one of the sort of pro kinds of projects. I build a lot of things in parking lots. And I do a lot of work at nature centers because nature centers are at the forefront of uh, trying to correct our re built relationship with nature. And um, here's another parking lot item. So uh, uh, there are a lot of proposals in this uh, line of work because not everything gets built. Um, I do a lot of work inside museums. Sometimes it doesn't have anything to do with green infrastructure, but it shows you the structure of your watershed. And um, I do a lot of permanent work. Uh, most of the time when I'm working, I am working with teams uh, composed of uh, landscape architects and building architects, engineers, ecologists, um, sometimes city planners, not as often as I would like, and um, oftentimes community liaison people too. So. Um, the teamwork is very, very important because it used to be that art was sort of heroically done by one, usually a man, up in a garret, starving, and it was all about what was inside them and it was coming out on the canvas and they would bring their canvas down all the stairs and present it to the world and hang it on a wall. Somehow that's not really going to work for every artist and it's really not going to work in terms of looking at the world in a different way and trying to solve problems too. So this new kind of art is much more collaborative and artists are often um, the matrix that holds a team together. Artists don't have massive amounts of professional training and we don't have errors and omissions and we don't have board certification. So we're more fluid. So when we're on a team, we can kind of work between the different disciplines. But one thing that's very important that I've been seeing is how, how essential it is to have everybody's individual hard drive out on the table. We can't solve these problems with just the engineer's hard drive anymore or just the building architect's hard drive. The, the problems are larger than one discipline. So interdisciplinary work and collaboration is really where it's at for, for solving on-site um, situations. And making these collaborative teams and then having throwing an artist in the mix, I think it's a really great idea because artists are just cur naturally curious, otherwise we wouldn't have stuck with it. And they kind of um, make things happen. And some of the things they make happen is they, they're very interested in giving rain a place to infiltrate, as engineers are too, only slightly different versions of it. And celebrating nature in a very visible way, embracing the variable conditions, the fact that change is gonna happen and we're gonna love the change, not try and suppress it, and enhancing people's relationship to nature. And I'm not talking about the Tetons or, or, or the Rockies. This is like urban nature that might be a puddle on the street or um, a copse of trees or a median strip that has uh, some layers of vegetation in it. So it's our small little pieces of nature that we're trying to get people to connect to. So as a, um, it's sort of a couple of case studies. This is the Frick Environmental Center. Um, this is a living building challenge. There are not that many of them in America yet. There are two in Pittsburgh right now. This is the second one. The Phipps uh, Conservancy is the first one. Um, and 
these uh, buildings that are living building challenges, how many people know about the living building challenge? You probably many. Okay, it is, it's like lead on hormones. So it's like lead platinum squared with Superman's cape because there are this amount of rules, but instead of having the idea that it's a checklist, that if I have a shower, I get three points, and if I have, um, if I have bike parking, I get two points. And I've actually been on, in meetings where they said, if we, if we keep the artwork, we'll hold on to those two points, but if we ditch her, we're, we're going to lose them. It's like, wow, all I am is a point system? <laughs> the problem with LEAD. Um, Living Building Challenge thinks about the building as an organism. It has to create everything that it uses, so if it can take the sun and it has to make its own energy, it has to recycle its water, all of the materials except for wire have to come within 300 miles of the building and um, nothing can be toxic. And there are a whole lot of other rules that um, it's very cumbersome building pro uh, process at this point, but it, in about 10 years it will be very simple because enough people will have done it. There are so few people who have done it that just making the list of your materials can take six or seven months. Um, in this case, and there are petals of, of the things you're supposed to hit about um, that it needs to produce its own electricity, it needs to have its own water source and recycle its water. And one of the petals is for beauty too, which I really admire. Lead does not have a beauty aspect. But beauty is important. It makes you want to go to work. It makes you happy when you're at work. It brings, it brings something to people. So that's an important component. In this particular living building challenge, I am helping cover two of the petals. I'm covering beauty, as are some other aspects of the building. And I'm also covering the, the recirculation of water. I am part of the water system. And I say water funny because I'm from Philadelphia. Um, it's, I'm taking it off of the roof and the parking lots. And it's coming into the sculpture and running through down into the wetlands. I think I have a diagram here. Whoops. All right. There, oops, sorry. Now we're going to sorry, go back. The slow boat here. All right, so it's not going to do it. So there, so it, this is, you can see, um, oh, and I can even make this happen, I think, if I can talk to there. So we can, so the rain is coming off the roof. It's coming off of the parking lot area and these flat, less, slightly less porous areas. This is not in the living building challenge, but we are taking the extra water. And it's coming through my piece, running down it, and into the treatment wetlands. Now, I say my piece, but I was on the design team from b before we even had a building designed. And that is the way that you should have an artist. You should get them like voting early and often. They, the idea of getting an artist on before the building is there and before the landscape is formed is really essential because I think the real power of art is to move where you think things are going to be and to change how it's really going to happen. They were thinking about the water, but they weren't really thinking about the water becoming a central feature. So that, that was something that me as an artist was able to change. So I'm celebrating nature very visibly here. Let's go. And um, embracing these variable conditions of rain and dry. This place is a lot of fun when it's dry. It's even more fun when it's wet. And um, bringing um, people into this, into this place that they might have just walked over as a flat sidewalk. It's also it's an iteration of the um, shale ecology that's down below in the part of the forest you're going to walk to after you've entered this building. And it's kind of a magnification of that geology. So it imprints on your head. You've run down it. You've seen these different levels. And then you go into the woods and find this in a smaller form that you may have missed if this sort of imprint, its symbol of the shale ecology hadn't been kind of given to you through your feet. I think one of the most interesting ways of learning that we often forget is that we learn a lot through our, the soles of our feet, even if we are wearing sneakers. World's slowest quick. So th this is just a picture to show that these things evolve a lot. It was a, probably a three-year design process, and this was a very different piece where wetlands were on the top and they were on the bottom and they were running through it, and that doesn't always happen because budgets change and um, that makes a lot of things change. The piece sort of shrunk a little bit and then became more about the terrain. So there's a lot of refining the design on these, 
on these collaborative teams. The design just doesn't happen. And one of the things that's very important to know about collaboration is everyone's putting into the center pot, and it is the central ideas that come up, that percolate up, and nobody knows where, like whose idea, there's no authorship of those ideas. A really good collaboration is everyone working together, creating almost a, another entity of, of imagining and of working out a design, and that's a very important thing too, that um, I think artists sort of help with on the, on the um, on the process. So there it is, is a dry form. And um, one of the things that when artists are working with these other disciplines, it's very important to keep up. I am not a CAD operator, but I have to be able to work with someone who is in CAD. And it's something that you can expect your artists to do, that you're like, you're gonna have to, the, the landscape architect and the building architect are gonna have to work with you to get your thing into the fabric of the site. And it's very important that the art and the uh, landscape architecture and the architecture are sewn together as a single fabric. So you don't walk into one part and go, oh, there's the art, now I'm leaving the art and going into the landscape, because those are not buildings that work and they're not buildings that are beautiful. And the function has to run through every discipline. It has to run through the building because I'm using the roof of the building and, and it has to run through the landscape architecture because I'm using the grading of the site and the pathways. And it has to be about the art because I'm the one who's kind of in between all this stirring this up. So it's a real blending and one has to learn how to get your, your drawings and things into CAD. And I work very, very closely with um, these firms as the designs are going into construction documents. Um, I'm also working constantly with who's going to build it and how it's going to be built, what kind of materials I'm able to use, what kind of materials are tested and true, um, what's affordable, how is it handled, how is it delivered to the site. Um, and I'm constantly having to work out, is, can, am I meeting my budget? Is this still working on? And when they tell me, oh, that delivery cost just went up, can I, can I handle that? So there's a lot of um, moving things around. And in a lot of ways, my work is closer to being an architect or a landscape architect because of all the different variables that I'm having to deal with. Um, but making these places that are sort of like bunk beds of a place for people and a place for rain in the same in the same space is something that's very important to me to make art that actually has these two levels where rain can go and people can go and uh, and enjoy themselves even when it's kind of wet outside it would be um, it's I really want people to wake up, they're about to go to a field trip to an environmental center and it's raining. And instead of saying, oh, that's too bad, it's raining, I want them to go, yay, this is the perfect time, the perfect kind of weather to come here. We have so much rain, let's celebrate it and make it fun to go somewhere where the rain is really activated. So this is another project also at a, a nature center. Um, which gives a place for water and a place for people. This is an artist-led project, whereas the, the Frick was a sort of architect, I guess it was more architect, engineer-led project. And I'm working with engineers, ecologists, and fabricators. Um, now, you know, it's, sort of, it's interesting that a lot of my work does take place at schools and nature centers, because they are at the forefront of educating people about new ways of living with nature. And this idea that if a nature center can't be responsible for its own rain, why is the bank building downtown going to take it on? So it's sort of the first line of, um, of the environmental change of trying to live more equitably with nature. So, um, I, so there's a lot of engineering that goes on. In this case, I'm engineering so that the water that's pouring off the roof, which is measured and calculated, goes into a place and does not overflow these new banks of these um, uh, retention and um, uh, infiltration basins that are being made. So I'm overlaying my thinking with engineering thinking. And that's a, that the, I'm working directly with an engineering firm. So here I am, I've created this room that hovers over those infiltration basins. And the spirals are like gutters that are carrying the rain from the roof. And you can see um, to the right, that's, um, that's coming from the roof. And this is a, a sort of a, a spare gutter that has a pump. And some of the rainwater collects in one of these big totes and you pump 
and you can get some water during dry periods. Because what happens with these rain projects is they're less fun when it's not raining, so I have to create some kind of fun when it's dry. Um, and that's, I'm always thinking about that. These basins here are all about different kinds of pavements or, or different kinds of surfaces that we find in our urban habitat that, um, and, and you can check out how they infiltrate differently. So you can do a little compare and contrast with um, asphalt. Boy, I need, this is an asphalt. You can see the line striping, the gravel, grass, and meadow, and concrete. And you pour water into the meadow, and you see that it soaks in, but it doesn't soak into the concrete. So it's a little bit of learning your urban fabrics. And this is the, this membrane that is hovering over the plants. And one of the things that I learned is that, that I didn't, I mean, I've learned over time is that it's that, that mushy moment after rain, which can last a, a week or so, um, is it's not conducive to walk on the plants at that point because you're gonna compact the soil and you're gonna crush the roots and, and ruin the whole oxygen intake. So you really, if you have a wet spot, you really need to keep people off the plant roots and they're happier being off them anyway because it's high and dry up there and it's a lot more fun to be on this mesh. There's the um, infiltration basins just after they've been dug out. So you can see they do indeed exist underneath this. And it has a fairly complicated planting plan because many things are under this kind of screen, which is um, screening out sun, not rain, but it is, it is making shadier areas. And some areas are wetter and some are hotter. And so all of that had to be brought into consideration. If you're, I happen to have a fairly deep background in, in plant ecology because I was a forester for many years, but if you're an artist and you don't have that, you do have to work very closely with an ecologist to make sure, and a, perhaps a horticulturalist or a landscape architect, to make sure your plant choices are working with the actual site. You can't just say, I love red and purple together and sort of put them in there because you thought they were pretty together. There's a functionality that you have to be highly aware of and I think sometimes that's a new thing for artists to not just have total freedom about their aesthetic choices, but to have some reason behind their choices. Um, it, we have volunteer activities are very, very important part of these large projects. Um, the budgets are not great enough so that I can um, get them planted by people who are paid. And so I rely a great deal on volunteer uh, services and it also brings people to a site and makes them understand it in a certain way that no one else is going to understand it. Few people got to be under this mesh structure planting and you know once we and we sealed it up though it, we can still open it up for more planting. So they have a special relationship with the place. And then afterwards that sort of hovering steel membrane is a lot of fun to be on and it works as a classroom. It's their outdoor classroom for the Science Center, but it's also really fun to be on because it's fun to hover. It's like being on a dock or something over a, a lake. And one of the important things is you have to make these kind of things for all seasons. They can't just look good in the spring. It's got to be something that's active throughout the season because this um, environmental center is gonna be part of people's experience throughout the season. And things like you know the waterfall of ice that you get with the snow coming down, the, the, um, or frozen precip precipitation coming down the gutters is, is a lot of fun and um, you know, a, great, a great thing. So I'm thinking about like, the way that STEM started out, and they, someone came up with the great idea to add A to STEM and make STEAM, because you add art, art to, the, to the whole deal. I'm thinking that we have to add A to, um, to green infrastructure to make it Gaia, the name, the ancient name for Earth. Um, so I think that green artful infrastructure alternatives should be our new GI should turn into Gaia instead. And some of the rules for just thinking about how you can do that is getting artists on the team early, early, early in the design process, before the design has even processed. And giving artists some clout, too. We don't have the same kind of professional background that, say, an architect does. And so we're often sort of relegated to a slightly um, lower position in the team. Just not intentionally, but it happens. So in order to kind of regain the balance, sometimes it's very handy if you're starting one of these projects and you're creating a collaborative um, team 
is to give the artists some kind of clout. Maybe, they have, maybe they're controlling the budget. I've had some of my best projects because I'm the one who's holding the purse strings and people listen to you if you're writing the checks. Um, then the idea when you're doing an art project in any kind of setting, the idea of segregating the art to a very specific X marks a spot kind of place just doesn't work for this new kind of art. It probably it worked great for Michelangelo. It works fine if you want to have a big silver sculpture in the middle of your plaza, but it does not work for uh, integrated art and art that's about green infrastructure. You can't say it's going to happen here or there. It's going to probably happen throughout. And one of the things is you have to let the artists figure out how they're going to interact with the site. You cannot you can't dictate that. And instead of saying this spot or this spot are the places you need to choose, you say, can you speak or can you direct your work towards these kind of interventions and make a list of interventions that you're interested in having for the site. Instead of, instead of pedestals, you're thinking about concepts and what you would like the artist to potentially address in, in, as they create their design and refine it. So this is a project um, on the shores of the Delaware River with Biohabitats Incorporated and their great and large um, landscape architecture and ecological restoration firm out of Baltimore. And in, in this one, I was on very early in the process. We went down to see the site, nothing was there. And we sat down with trace paper at the local uh, union hall and started sketching out some ideas of what we thought. And everyone was just coming to the table with this basically the same amount of information. And um, it was an ex extremely fertile design time. Um, and so this is, I, but I had, I had a sort of idea that I wanted to get forward where I had thought about doing this in a parking lot. And so I was bringing this up, this idea like, can the parking lot do more work here than what it's doing? And so um, we were able to sit down with this kind of idea in mind and start to play with the, with the idea. Um, and on this site, it was completely covered with hardscape. It was either asphalt or what you see here, concrete. And there's about 18 inches of concrete. It's the most wonderful industrial concrete. It used to be a factory and a pier. And we, if we were to take all the concrete away and make it a green park, just the demolition and the carrying the, the concrete off would have been the entire budget. So we really had to get around that. It's like, if we want to make anything, we got to keep most of the stuff on the site. So what do, we, what do we do? We have to address the whole site like that. So um, one of the things was to cut into it, the existing one, cut into it with interesting patterns and turn those into like gravy boards, you, what you put the roast on and all the juices go down the, go down the bio swales of the tray. The same with the rain, the juices of the rain are coming towards the river and are, getting, are going into that swale and, and being filtered out by the planting. And that's in uh, about three seasons later. Though everything was planted with native grasses at the time, that is not the only plants that survived. And I always say that when you're working in hot parking lots, which are really, they're either terribly cold or terribly hot, that you have to think of Kermit the Frog, who sang, it ain't easy being green. So, Anything that was growing was allowed to grow after a certain point, though the natives did come back in and establish themselves more over time. And um, so this sort of idea of like using swales, not just as lines through there, but as sort of artful designs in the fabric of something ordinary like a parking lot was very much about what this piece was about. And then also using, um, harnessing ideas from other natural processes. We, we could not get rid of all of this concrete, so we had to think about how does concrete slowly erode? And one of the ways is, is plants get into it and their roots are coming down through it and then the water gets in and breaks it apart. So we were using the concept of the enemy of my enemy is my friend because with freeze-thaw cycles in time, it would start to break the hard surface apart. Now, this would take a very long time, but it was like a concept in action. You could see it happening slowly, and the idea that it could be eroded through time by structuring the erosion was a very interesting concept, even though it's not absolutely true in certain parts. 
But we did have to um, work out what we were going to do with a lot of the stuff we did break up. from. There were certain areas we wanted to plant a little more heavily. So we created this rubble garden. And you can see the, the line striping. Um, these are the old pieces of parking lot right here. And so they've been rearranged and then planted with native vegetation in between. And one of the things we learned is that in, a, in a, uh, an urban park that gets a lot of traffic, one of the ways of saving the plants um, by not allowing compaction was to create these stepping stones where people could keep their feet dry and still sort of be out in, in the midst of the sort of the shoulders of the park. So people jump from rock to rock and they didn't step so much on the plants, which um, made the plants really thrive. And um, after three seasons, this place really took off and it has a great native uh, flower population um, and is um, really doing quite well. One of the things that's important to remember is, uh, is this kind of um, this kind of art looks different than other kinds of art. The stat more static forms of art look great the day they go in, probably look the best the day they go in, and then decline from there. Whereas um, green infrastructure art, mm, not its best moment when it first goes in, has a lot of growing to do typically before it looks really fabulous. But it does get better and better with time, and there's not much in the way of built things that actually improve with time. But um, green infrastructure art has a tendency to do that. So that's, that's a, a great part about it too. And here we're also creating these controlled puddles. Puddles are gonna happen in urban settings. What if you like consolidated them? A controlled puddle is kind of a rain garden and a rain garden is kind of controlled puddle. Then this other project, this is at the Springside School in Philadelphia that I just showed you a, a, just a snippet of before, um, which is just a very elaborate downspout disconnect and all about rain going down, being conveyed down, and then having a chance to infiltrate. So this is what my site was. I think when I was first asked to do this, and it was the Philadelphia Water Department sponsored this to a degree, they thought I was going to put a couple of barrels or small rain gardens out under some of these um, out under those, those existing white uh, gutters. And I was like, well, I'm probably not gonna end up doing that. And I was so taken by this very underutilized piece of lawn. This piece, there are doors out of two different classrooms, three different classrooms, and no one ever went out there because it was an extremely uninviting space, even though it was green. So instead, this is what happened. So the, the water is being conveyed down the building in these tributary patterns. And um, there's actually, to sort of prove to people that there is water running down there in these sections of glass pipe so that you can see the water rushing through during a rainstorm. And then there's quite an elaborate uh, rain garden between the wall of the building and the road, as well as a... Um, a little terrace right in here. Now this terrace is about a tenth or maybe even less of an uh, open space for people to hang out in. But now people go out there and read and hang out because they're sitting in amidst nature. There are different uh, flowering things going on. There are different insects coming out. It's a really active space, unlike that very dull lawn that was there before. It also, um, if we had just done the rain garden, which is very beautiful and could have been all that we did, then you wouldn't have gotten the 40 mile an hour view of what was happening. People would have simply passed the rain garden and said, oh, something's blooming or not. But in this case, that car, the, as they're passing, is actually looking back at the wall. So their, their, their view is activated. So there's some sense like something is happening here. One of the problems with green infrastructure is it's often so invisible that you, you just don't even know you've walked over it. So art has a, has a, a good job in just trying to make people think twice about what they're passing by. This is like a very specific angle to make this work. And once again, this is a, another set of volunteers. These are, these are they're, they did not volunteer. They were forced to do this. This is a K through 12 school. And every grade did plant. Um, they're planting the iris swale right now. I've always been influenced by Japanese gardens that have dry, dry areas that are, are that sense water, visualize water with the blue, the blue uh, blossoms of, of irises, of blue flag iris. But so they're getting a lot of hands-on experience. And this, I'll just um, 
diverge a bit, bit to say that a lot of people ask about what kind of community involvement you do before you start your projects. And I do a fair bit of community involvement. But as I've gotten older, I am finding that the involvement with the community is almost best done while you're building, not while you're designing. People are at a kind of a loss when you say, hey, what do you think you want on this site? It becomes a kind of Christmas wish list of impossible things. Everyone wants a water park. It's like, do you have any idea what that's going to cost? But if you say, this is, if you're a good listener and you're translating as a human and thinking, I'm listening to what these people are thinking about wanting, and I'm trying to think what I would want in this situation, and you make something of sort of normative design where you're thinking like a human and giving people human design for this place, and then they get to interact with it through the construction. That's a much deeper relationship that you create with that building activity than with that wishing activity with community meetings and post-it notes and hopes and desires versus fears. So I've really found that getting people to construct, which is something that people do not get to do, hands-on experience is a rare experience in this day and age. So giving people that has been great, and you get a lot of bonding to the site because they planted or screwed things together or dug something out. So that's when the involvement needs to happen. There's the Irish swale right now. Um, it's not blooming, of course. I never catch it when it's blooming. I don't live close enough. And there's this uh, view of the, um, the gutters. All done with pipes from Lowe's or Home Depot. And a little bit of a, the, a rivulet that's carrying um, the water from the wall through the, across the uh, terrace there. This um, is another project that we did. This is a very big team effort, and it remains unbuilt. It was a competition that we actually won, and we're waiting for Philadelphia to come up with the funding, and it hasn't done it yet, but maybe one day it will. This is a zero-lot site. There is nowhere to infiltrate here, and yet it's very important that um, if if Philadelphia could, like most cities, could stagger the output of buildings after, right after a storm event, then the, um, the combined sewer systems would not be overwhelmed after every single storm event. If you could hold on to your water and let it go in a staggered, like, you go and then I'll go, kind of like a relay, it would work much better. So we're trying to work on this sort of relay race of letting, of letting the water go. So we're designing to hold on to water. Um, and in this particular one, there was one for um, a, a, a suburban site, one for a mall site, and then this zero lot site just had no ground. We did have a park across the street, but it was hard to get to, so that's sort of an addendum. Um, this is a team of, of engineers and landscape architects. Now we're into having roof garden experts as well as community organizers and um, ecologists too. So we were all checking this place out and coming together saying, what are we going to do? Um, and so one of the things was that design puddle idea. The roof gardens are not just gardens, but they're kind of roof puddles, and they're holding on to the water, and some of it is evaporating from the roof. It's basically a series of pans. And the other idea was to use the verticality of the walls to hold the water. We usually think about infiltration as being something on the horizontal plane going down several feet, but... Hmm. Let's see, where did that just go? But in this case, we were using the, we, ha we didn't have any horizontal space. We're on a, there's nothing, there's sidewalk there in the road and we can't go into that. So we're talking about creating puddles or holding bins on the skin of the building in a vertical way. So it's, the building is holding its water for 24 hours. It's slowly letting it seep out through these, um, through these, these uh, kind of blue skin containers that then are leaking out or seeping out is a better word to these um, these uh, vertical gardens and then there's the um, the entire factory made this mesh uh, a steel mesh that we were using to make both the the vertical gardens and also the signage for this um, for the site um, plus to make the garden walls on this uh, pergola out here 
So we're using the fa what the factory is manufacturing and trying to have the rain hold onto the side of the building instead of the grounds of the building because we just simply didn't have any space. So just going on to the solving a site issue, um, art is also very effective as a problem solver. Now, art traditionally has not been considered something that solves problems. In fact, when I first proposed this piece, they said, if art is doing something, if your project is gonna do something, is it still art and can we still show it? It's like, what? But I have, I was, I, I, I schooled in a period where if you had function, you became a craft instantly as a piece of art. That's how we used to define what was art and what was craft. Craft has a function, it's a teapot, it's, a, it's something you can wear. In, in this case, art was always held up as something that could have no function. Well, I'm gonna throw that out because I think it was a silly premise and just not doesn't work in this, in this day and age where everything needs to function and everything has the possibility to find a solution or at least poke around in the dark for a solution. So I'm very into working artworks and art that actually solves site conditions. In this case, it's over nutrification and eutrophication of this urban lake, which is in Fayetteville, um, uh, Fayetteville Arkansas, thank you, and um, is due to a lot of uh, farmlands uh, having their water, the water come off the farmlands and on, into the lake, but also a lot of people who want green lawns and have chem lawn come out, and then they get a brown lawn with a green lake. Sort of like somebody didn't color the picture of your landscape correctly, because this is obviously not working. This is just a soup of algae. Um, What's, what's not, the, what, there's not enough of something that there is some of, there's some, this is Juncus effusus, this is the wetland edge which is growing along the lake, it would make a perfect filter if it went back 150 yards, but it's only, you know, there might be 250 plants around this entire lake. So we need more of that, we need more of the wetland edge. What can art do to make that happen? Um, it can look into other ways of doing biomimicry, creating these, um, these wetlands in another form. And in this case, it's a floating wetland. And plants are stuck in some kind of floating matrix. And the roots are taking up some of the nutrients, but really the periphyton bacteria that's on the roots is actually doing a lot of the processing of the, um, of the phosphorus and the nitrogen. So that's, um, it, the plant is sort of containing it as well as what's growing on the plant. And there's a kind of upside down forest which is perfect for the fish to be in, in a shady kind of uh, entangled area. Fish really need that for their habitat and are very happy there. And if fish are happy there, that means fishermen are happy having this out there. So this is the typical wetland design. It looks like a floating mattress out on the water. And I was thinking, wow, great idea, but I think we need a new form. So I started to look at these, these archetypes of art forms. This is uh, Robert Smithson's spiral jetty. This is an amazing earthwork, but remember it is an earthwork, it is not an environmental art piece. He took, you know, a, about six bulldozers and moved a lot of the basalt rock out into the and it's obvious to look at, but basically it is a giant drawing on the landscape. It's not doing anything. That was fine for him, that's not enough for me. And so I've always had a mixed feeling about this piece and I thought I need to revisit it. You should always look at what is disturbing to you or that you actually hate because there's something in it that is probably informing your work. So I'm like, why does this piece bug me in this way? Because of its sort of, its sort of giant gesture that doesn't seem to be doing that much. So I wanted to recreate the gesture in a floating wetland and created the spiral wetland um, and that was out on the lake and is actually helping treat the water and making fish habitat and looking very cool as it floats along there. This is its first season out on the lake. There it is, you can see the little, um, the little looks like a fern um, on one end of the lake, that's Lake Fayetteville. And it would take about 10 to 12 more spirals to actually treat all the eutrophication on this lake. And I don't have the budget to do 10 or 12. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't stick your neck out and put one out there and say, hey, 
possible solution for the future. And come on board, engineers. Maybe we should make a few more of these. So it's very important to just put it out there as an idea so that people can digest the idea, kind of get used to the idea that floating wetlands can be a different form, and maybe adopt it over time. So there I am testing it out on my pond. I live in the middle of the rural hinterlands in the Ridge and Valley in Pennsylvania. And one of the benefits of having to drive everywhere is that I also have a lot of land to test things on. And it's really, really critical to test your materials out. Um, that is one of my jobs as the, the kind of artist that I am. I have to know what I'm, what I'm, the materials I'm using are gonna work over time. And I'm talking about like two years or three years over time and many seasons and what happens if it's really cold and does it stay apart and does it fall apart with too much sunlight. And so these are all important things to test out in reality. And people who don't have enough property somewhere, you can borrow vacant lots and test things out, and you can use rooftops to test things out too. So you don't have to have a farm to do it on and to drive your spouse crazy, but you can do it in other places. But knowing your materials and knowing what happens to them over time is really important. And knowing to, if your materials are robust enough. When you're building in nature, it's going, your artwork is going to take a beating. It's really, um, there, each season offers up something special and difficult. There's ice jamming in the winter, and there's spring floods in the spring, and there's a cold crack in the winter, and summer has massive UV and shrinking and cracking. And so there's always something you have to know that these materials can hack it. Because if they can't, then you're building in this ever-changing situation with basically with tissue paper. So once again, it always takes a lot of people to put these things together. Volunteers are an essential part of this kind of artwork. Um, and sometimes you have to get your volunteers wet in order to do things. We had to plant in the water because the, of the nature of the um, roots sticking down. Um, and in this case, we were doing a lot of monitoring to see what our results were like. Was this actually functioning? Was this doing anything to the nitrogen? What were these plants taking up phosphorus? And I worked with um, students at the, uh, in the biology and the ecology department at the University of Arkansas to, um, to do tests on this. So we would take out five plants every month and put them in the kiln and bake them down and see what, how much nutrients they had picked up. And it was, it was functioning. It wasn't as fast as I wanted it to be, but it only got to be out there for its first year. Remember how these, um, these kinds of works are slow to get developed particularly when you're using perennials. And perennials, anyone who's dealt with them knows that it is uh, sleep the first year, creep the second year, leap on the third growing season. This, never, this got to sleep. And that was pretty good for sleep because they were this high when they went in and they didn't sleep that well. Um, and, but we, this could if it was in for three years, it probably would have been you know, 36 inches high, and it would have been great. But there were all sorts of reasons that we couldn't leave it in. Um, it did get adopted in the end. It's very important when you're using materials, particularly for temporary projects that aren't going to remain in that situation, that they have a second life. And I'm always planning that in. Everything gets adopted. In this case, um, this thing was taken apart. Um, and whole sections of it went to golf courses and to their retention basins. And it, if we couldn't have people adopt the actual mats themselves, then they took the plants out and planted them around their own ponds and, and retention basins in other parts of Fayetteville. And it did really create a, it created a destination in the lake. Um, and so there was a great deal of interaction, particularly with the fishermen who really loved it and were very disappointed when we took it in. And just, um, I believe this is the last one. This is the Penn State Arboretum. So just changing the typical way things are done, altering something. In this case, they asked me to do a project at the new Arboretum. It, it had, there's one building in the Arboretum. And I said, I want to have all the rainwater from the roof of that building. And it's going to run through my piece. And then we're going to infiltrate it. So I'm working directly with the architect, the building architect, because I need to grab the water that his roof has access to, and with the landscape architect, because I want them to help me infiltrate and get this water back into the ground. And it's a large, um, so it, and it has a, a sort of celebration of the wet and dry, so it's a great thing to visit when it's raining. Um, and it creates an entire map of the watershed that that 
um, that rainwater from the roof spills out onto and follows the actual watershed. So it recreates the watershed in miniature in stone every time it rains. And when it's dry, it's just a great place for people to figure out where what their watershed address is. A lot, you know, you know 30,000 students there coming from all over, and they have no idea where they just landed when they get to university. So it's kind of a good you are here device also for people to understand what, what the land is that they're standing on. So. So this is where I think art can really come into green infrastructure. It helps people visualize the natural process and it connects them with nature. It gives them a way to interact with the site. Either you're jumping over blue dots or you're finding your place in the watershed. And it can solve site issues. It can get the rainwater from point A to point B and allow it to infiltrate. Or it can clean up the rainwater and filter the rainwater as it's moving through the site. Um, and it's very important when you're administrating these kinds of projects to know that it's not going to be a static situation. It's not something you can put in and forget. It's going to require maintenance, and it's going to be changeable over time. Um, so this, this, this way of building so that you can show wet and dry and high water and low water does have to be extremely robust and adaptive, flexible to the situation. Because anything that's rigid will be pummeled to death by high water, or um, it will just wash away. So you have to build in a lot of flexibility. Um, I noticed this the other day. I was reading something, and it turns out that Ben Franklin put in his will all this money because he realized that, the at the time, this word impervious was not part of things. But since covering the ground blot with buildings and pavements would carry off most of the rain and prevents it from soaking into the earth and renewing the springs, the waters of the well become un... Well, that's not unit. That should be unfit for use. So 200 years ago... The exact same problem, too much hardscape, not enough sharing with nature, no home for the rain. And uh, there's a, a man who can, who's quite a visionary who's wondering, you know, what, what's going to happen to our drinking water supplies because they're not going to be replenished. So this is not a new issue, but what might be new is to bring artists in to solving it. We are, we're kind of the wild card that might make things a little bit different this time around. So this is the, uh, the Gaia theory, the, the modern Gaia theory for me. Um, and anyone who is thinking about having artists on teams, creating teams, administrating green infrastructure and wondering how to do it, I think that these are some artist-led tips that could really help how you're going to see this, this process. And uh, that's, that, these, that this collaborative thinking that these are the things that need to go on in collaborative thinking. And one of the important things is to always remember that rain is your client. That's your first client. And after that, everyone lines up and becomes the next series of clients. But you have to build for rain and ways of making the rain happy and having a place and having the time it needs to soak in. So it's very important to make a proper home for the rain. So thank you. And I can take any questions, too, afterwards. Since we're recording, how about I take the mic out if people have questions? That's, so that's an excellent idea. Everybody, anybody have my list? I have my list. Is this working? OK. Just wanted to make sure it was working before I handed it. Hi, um, it works awesome, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you give maintenance manuals to your clients. I see perennials in parking lots and I just think about plows just decimating them in the winter and how you kind of proceed with, with I do educating give, I do give winter. maintenance um, manuals to people, but they often sit on their shelves and never get out there. So I have to build with the idea that somebody might plow that. That particular parking lot is probably not going to be plowed, but it will be salted, which is very hard on the plants. And that's why we say there are certain times where you're like, well, whatever grows there that's green, we're going to let grow there. There are other situations where I really have to reformat the um, institutional maintenance for a place. And we say, 
Uh, there will be no salt used here. We're gonna, we have to stop doing that. And the plows will not be used here. At the Frick, they can't plow that lower path. They can't salt that area because it won't hurt the plants. It will hurt the wetland plants, but it will also hurt my mortar joints as much as anything. So that becomes part of the building's maintenance. And yes, working with the crews of maintenance is really important for me. And if I'm putting something in a place that has already been built and the maintenance people are in, uh, you know, in situ there, I work directly with them when we talk a lot about what, what can be done and what they simply don't want to touch. And then I might build differently according to what they say. Like, we're not going to be able to do anything up above six feet might make me change certain ways I'm going to build, knowing what their parameters for maintenance are. But I do often ask, I mean, there are places that I've said we cannot use salt here any longer, and that's just how they do it. Then they just, they have to stop using salt. And um, I'm about to put in a piece where they have said they will not plow this particular um, area with, um, with a particular type of plow. So, yeah. What about sand? Because <laughs> even over time, sand in a... A sand hasn't been a problem. Sand, I think they've used that on the arboretum, and they just, it has to get vacuumed out occasionally, but it's not that much of a problem. Heather? Question, comment? Frank? Somebody has a question. Right back. Right back. The depth of the pond. Where you put out the oh the one that's in the parking lot along the oh the pond the the floating uh, wetland plants oh the the how deep was that pond oh that that we we do call that a lake now because oh, it's a okay. town the town lake <laughs> the depth of that um, was ranged from about fifteen feet to sixty feet in places because I was worried about the roots eventually getting down to the bottom and then you would have uh, plants sprout up all over the pond. Not if it's too deep. I mean, you, as you know, wetland plants are all about depth. So in this case, these are, would only get to a certain depth. Now, one of the things about um, floating wetlands, which is great, is they always stay on the surface of the water. So you can have a flood, and they don't get inundated, especially when they're young. And you can have a drought, and they don't like lose their water source, especially if they're having a hard summer. So the idea that this thing slides up and down with the water level and always stays at the perfect water level for the plants works out very well. Now, I guess if it kept getting shallower and shallower, if it was a very shallow area, they could, they could connect to the ground. But then you would just be planting directly into the substrate of the shallow water. You wouldn't worry about spending a lot of money on the mats. Thank you. So uh, you had mentioned getting uh, artists involved early. And I know I can go out to state bid lists and I can find all the engineers, and I can find the structural people and the concrete suppliers. It, how the hell do you find <laughs> environmental artists? That's an, there are a couple of ways. There are usually um, fairly local arts commissions, and, and your, your most local art commission is probably uh, New England Foundation for the Arts. They often have lists of artists who they vetted, so you get a pre-vetted roster, um, and so you can work that way, and you can say to them, I have a project, I have $100,000 for an artist fee to pay them and to also build this thing. Um, can we have a competition where everyone sends in their um, requests for qualifications? And then you are on the panel of choosing them, and then you choose an artist from that. And you use New England Foundation for the Arts to help you go through that panel selection process, which can take a good couple of months. And then, bingo, you've got your artist. The other thing is you can do, is, um, and we've done this before, there's a, um, a trail down in Lexington, Kentucky that was being finished up and they needed an artist list very quickly. And we worked with a number of artist institutions in the area and, got, and created a roster that got publicized by everyone and artists found out about it and sent their slides in. And there was one person who then wrangled all the slides and was able to see who might be the best bet for matching up with the, with the site. Yeah. I was just going to ask if Bridgewater State University had a comment on, <laughs> on that, too. 
Other? Oh, Carl. Um, that environment looks somewhat rural, but more urban in nature. <clears throat> and here in Bridgewater, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a lot of developments going in. Uh, you know, I don't know, 100 houses and some, you know, they're packed in pretty well. What kind of art projects might you suggest for those kinds of things? Or let's say that there's an apartment complex or uh, mixed use going in and you've got limited land. What kind of art projects would one contemplate there? I think one of the places that um, needs to be addressed in, in all our lives are the parking lot because everyone puts in a, a, a lot, a, a, a space for every single car. Um, and figuring out there'll be, I don't know, 1.5 cars per every unit that they're building. But that's going to change. We're not all going to own cars in the future because things like ride shares and, and um, uh, self-driving cars are going to change that. And so there's going to be more space in our parking lots in time. So the places that were designed for a 1.5 car per unit are going to have, there's going to be some landscape real estate there. Um, and so that would be one place to start to start to diminish the parking lots. Um, and the, param the edges, the perimeters of the parking lots are also areas that can be utilized so that the parking lot drains into some kind of swale that has the, and the artwork is about when the water rolls down that swale or maybe shows the flow of water over time. Um, so these, even these very small margins that are trying to absorb some of the parking lot water could be um, areas where art can be created. The, the art of infiltration is actually what's being done, and maybe there's some additional visualization of that act going on there. So a lot of, um, a lot of the artwork can happen in what I call the gristle. It's the places where you can't build. It's neither meat nor fat nor bone, it's sort of leftover. And the gristle places are places where you can, you can put the art. And artists are very good at finding those places and then consolidating them visually. Like there might be one over there and one over there, but somehow they're pulled together by some visual um, repetition so that you say, oh, it starts to add up. And this little corner here and that little piece over there are all part of something. And that's a way of, of maximizing um, places for art where there don't seem to be that many footprints for art. Any other questions? Stacy? do you have, I have kind of a, probably an ignorant question, but anyway, I just ask it. Um, any, any sort of idea of, does this increase the cost of projects considerably? I mean, I know you talked about that a little bit at the beginning, but I just think that that's gonna be a concern uh, for I this will say that session. artists are one of the cheapest assets you can throw at a site. First of all, we have no sense of hourly rate wages, so we just end up working for a buck three eighty because it's like, wow, I got totally into it. You know, no engineer that I know would say like, sure, I'll give that an extra fifteen hours of research because I love it. So artists are extremely economical to use, uh, for the most part. Yes, the projects cost a fair bit of money add a certain amount of money, but nothing like, like what the actual infrastructure is adding. It's, it, it's only, it seem, you know, $100,000 seems like a lot, but you're talking about, a, you know, a million dollar site or, you know, when I go, I, I went to try and pave my very long driveway and when I got the cost of just what the asphalt was gonna cost and the 2B gravel underneath, it's like, what? I could, I could just do something fun myself for half of that budget. So. Artists are really a great way of getting more bang for your buck. And also, um, for the most part, when you know artists have a terrible uh, reputation of being offensive to the world and making things out of materials that offend people, but for the most part, artists are really embracing of community and culture, and so they're adding something that usually has a sort of um, uh, inclusiveness that people who are walking along the construction site can relate to, unlike uh, three Jersey barricades and, and five parking spots and pressed asphalt. So you add a lot of value with a very little bit of, about, a, little bit of a budget for art. You add a lot of value and good feeling towards these constructions. Can I just pass it back here? Yeah, we could probably talk all night, so I'll, <laughs> I'll try to keep it limited. 
you heard of the ecosystem value, uh, how you quantif monetize the value of an ecosystem? I, I have, yeah. Yeah, and so that's what I'm thinking, is that one thing you can do from a cost perspective is if, for example, you take this, that development I talked about, if you could move the water not from the street but to some kind of retention basin, so it's not getting into the streets, it's not worrying things down, then you have a value and you've created value that it's a little bit harder, but you can quantify the value. So that's my answer to one, one of the questions. Right, and that's cost. a great thing to be able to do. I have not been that successful in water projects where I've quantified what people are saving Particularly in Philadelphia now, where you are paying for you're paying a, a tariff on your stormwater, um, and I remember I was giving someone a, a break of a thousand bucks a year if they would build this sort of wetland area that I was creating, and I don't know they just they didn't see the value of that. So sometimes it can work if you can say. I'm, this is gonna save you from this tariff or it's gonna save you um, issues over here that you would have to build for otherwise. And that's where the coming in, doing things early is really important because it's hard to sort of retrofit that stuff in if you haven't started with the concept and gone all the way through and you are actually creating savings in the construction too. So our town will hopefully be rewriting our zoning. Um, can you think of any language that one might put in a zoning code that would encourage? Yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> I just got hung up on a project. It's a, a nature center down in Charlotte, near Charlotte, North Carolina, that is all about creeks. And we were going to spread the water, the, all the runoff, throughout the site and make all these wonderful places for it to soak in and you could watch it run. And then the zoning came through and said, no, no, we need to have, if you're building this many square feet of blah, 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 you have to have this many retention basins. It's like we are the retention basin. We just don't look like the retention basin. No, no, retention basin has to be this big, this big, this deep, this, this wide. And... I'm, I'm fighting this right now because I'm working with a landscape architect who's a little bit weak-kneed and didn't want to go up to the zoning people and say, we've covered these bases, we're doing this a new way, so like, let's look to the future. This guy's like, well, this is what they told me, so this is what we got to do. And so now I am having a major back and forth. So somebody has to stand up and... I, if, it, if you're rewriting zoning, I think you should say all of these rules are you know, should be changed if you can prove that res the end result um, results in this has the same uh, value afterwards. If I can drain and infiltrate this landscape, but I do it in spirals instead of in straight basins, then let me do it. So I think that you should always have this caveat in the zoning that says, if this can be done a different way, please allow this poor artist to do that. Did you have <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very, very Thank much. you for coming. <laughs> Just one.